So before we dive into how to create templates themselves and their structure, I want to talk about how CloudFormation updates and deletes resources. You know, the reason is that there's some gotchas around updates that are good to, well, they're, they're must know. <laughs> if you don't, well, sometimes you can delete things you don't intend to. And pretty much 100% of the time, <laughs> those deletions are the last thing you want to happen. So let's start with updates. To do so, we're just going to use an example. And this is all going to be conceptual. And obviously, this is going to be fictional. So let's say that we built a template and it defines an EC2 instance in it. There's nothing else to it. It's just a plain old instance that's not running an application at all. It's just up and live. Well, first up, let's go ahead and head over to the EC2 instance documentation uh, for CloudFormation. So here I am in the resource and property types reference. And again, if I'm treating this like the console, I would find EC2. And then if I was in the EC2 console and I wanted to look at instances, well, I would select instances. And similarly here in the documentation, I'm gonna go into the instance resource. And so let's just take a look at the JSON syntax here. You know, these are all of the things that we can put on our instance. And a lot of these should look familiar if you've done anything with the with EC2 before, which hopefully you have. And specifically, the property that we're going to look at for this example is image ID. And it's with this property that we tell CloudFormation and, of course, AWS what Amazon machine image that we want our instance to use. And again, all that is is just the starting configuration for the server. So are we using Amazon Linux 2? Are we using Ubuntu? Or maybe some other type of image with a different operating system on it? And again, folks, you know, if the word AMI and image is, you know, going over your head, I really suggest going through our EC2 fundamental series because it, it will tell you everything you need to know to be caught up to speed with this. But okay, let's, let's say we're using some version of Amazon Linux 2. Well, the way we tell it to use that particular Amazon machine image is we'd get its ID, which you would be able to find from the EC2 console or the docs, and we would list it just like shown in these examples, right? So if we go down to examples, here we can see that this is all you do to define your Amazon machine image. Well, that's great and all, but what happens if we want to change the image? Well, you would, as you can probably guess, we would just change the image ID to the new ID for the new AMI, Amazon machine image, that we'd like to use. But what do you expect to happen after we do this? Well, what will happen is it'll actually kill the current instance and make a new one with the new Amazon machine image. And so as you can imagine, if you weren't expecting your instance to go down, you'd have some problems. So, you know, <laughs> you might be thinking, Whoa, so you're telling me that when I go to update something, my template, it might get deleted and replaced instead of just straight updated? And yeah, <laughs> it seems a little bit annoying until you think about how you do it in the console. You know, if you want to change the underlying Amazon machine image in an instance in the console, well, what do you do? Well, you just, you have to make a new one. And even though that, that's a great way to think about all of this, right, there's an easier way to figure out what's going to happen when you update a property on a resource you've defined in your CloudFormation template. So first up, let's head back over to the docs. And what property are we looking at changing? Well, the image ID. So why don't we just find image ID on here? If I can search here, here we go. So here's the image ID. We see a quick blurb about what it does. And then there's this nice little property here called update requires. And here we can see right next to it, what does it require? Well, it requires replacement. And if you look through these properties, right, you know, some like image ID require the complete replacement of an instance, but others like instance initiate shutdown behavior, well, it doesn't interrupt the instance at all. It'll just keep going on like nothing has happened, right? And we can keep going through more of these like instance type and, you know, IPv6 address count. And they just tell you, they just show you through all of these exactly what's going to happen. Now, for some of these, they don't list it. So, for example, instance type, they don't list what an update requires. And I assume it's because they just, <laughs> they decided that it was pretty obvious. But yeah, if you change your instance type from, say, a smaller one to a bigger one, it is going to replace it. So this brings up two things that we need to talk about. First, how can AWS go about updating your resources? 
Well, there's three possibilities. The first is it can update them with no interruption at all. And so that instance initiated shutdown behavior, which is just telling your EC2 instance what it should do when you shut it down, right? That one requires no interruption at all. And there's other ones, updates with some interruption. And then finally, replacement. Those are the things it can do. And we can see the full docs for that. I have this page open and I'll make sure to link to it below the video. But if you look through this and you want to take the time, um, they go through the full details on the process and how it selects doing so or determines to do so. Now, this may seem like a lot to remember, but the workflow to make sure that you don't get caught blind is actually pretty simple. And that's the second thing here. All you have to do to avoid this is just when you update a resource, check that update requires property. It's that simple. So for example, again, when I go to change the image ID property on my instance, the best bet is for me to just double check the update requires property. You know, by just simply looking that over, I'll know what's going to happen. So that's all there really is when it comes to updating and catching what AWS will do to your stack. If you recall from the last video, when you upload a modified template to update a stack, you'll get a change set, right? So there's all three of those core terms there. Well, this is the second way that you can catch this. Yes, the, the, the change set will show you exactly what's going to happen. It'll tell you right there and we'll see it when we get into it. Is it going to replace it or is it going to interrupt it or is nothing going to happen at all? So. If some of this seems a bit odd, <laughs> just bear with me. When we get to the project, all this stuff will come full circle and make sense. For now, just get comfortable with the language and the terminology and just the way to think about it. So one last thing to touch on for updates. What happens if an update fails? Well, unless you tell it to do otherwise, it's actually pretty smart. It'll just roll your infrastructure back to its previous state. Now, this is obviously super useful for those times when you push up a bug or a typo that would otherwise result in everything going down. Uh, and again, we'll see this stuff in action when we get to the project. Just, just get familiar with the concepts and the terms for now. And so that's all for updating. When we update a stack, watch for how it will update your resources. Will it replace them, cause an eruption? Or will it do nothing at all? You know, and to figure out what CloudFormation will do, just watch that update requires field on any property you have. And if you forget to do that before you upload the temp, not before you upload it, but after you've uploaded the template and it shows you that change set of what it's going to do, make sure you look through that and make sure nothing is accidentally going to get interrupted or replaced when you don't intend it. And finally, if you put a bad update up there, CloudFormation is smart enough to roll back to its previous state. Okay, so on to our final and simple topic, the leading CloudFormation stacks. Now note that I said stacks, and this is again, just a reinforcement of terminology here. This goes for creates, updates, and deletes. Remember, you make a stack from a template. You then update and delete the stack. You might modify the template, but the template is just, well, it's the cookbook that you're making all of your, your different dishes from, where the dishes are the stack. Anyhow, when you've created a stack from a template, CloudFormation groups all of those resources together and it does so with tags and other metadata. Now this is really useful for organization, especially if you have multiple infrastructure setups in one account. It means there's little to no chance you'll accidentally trample on you know, so another stack or another stack's resources when updating or deleting your own, which you know, if you're just doing it in the console, <laughs> there, there's always room for that human error. Okay, but what is there to deleting CloudFormation stacks? How complicated could it possibly be? Well, it's actually not. <laughs> All you do is delete the stack. On the command line interface, it's just a simple command. On the console, it's just a couple of buttons. And after that, CloudFormation will correctly clean up all of the resources for that stack. And that's all there is on updating and deleting. Now, I'm sure that, that some of you are thinking, I can hear it through the screen in the past. <laughs> oh, geez, this sounds like a lot to keep in my head and we haven't even written a template yet. But trust me, it, it's really not that bad. And once we dive into the template anatomy and the project, all of this will come together beautifully.